So we are recording. So hi and welcome everyone. This is, uh, I don't know anymore. We have had so many brown bag lunches. But uh, today we have Neil Stevenson with us from Hazel Koss that will do his presentation. So please introduce yourself and uh, do the presentation. All right, thank you. Okay, let me... Uh... Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Neil Stevenson from Hazelcast. Um, I'll go on a little two slides time and tell you a little bit uh, about me, but uh, because I've done the slide deck all in advance, I'm going to start with uh, the slide deck. All right, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about CDC, uh, what can go wrong um, with CDC, or call data capture. WCGW, I hadn't heard the term CDC um, until a few years ago. Um, so CDC is change data capture. And this is kind of going to be a, a more of a, a kind of field stories kind of talk. Uh, things that I've found that uh, surprise me in a negative way about change data capture. And if you're uh, aware of these and you plan to deploy it uh, in your solution, then you'll be uh, one step ahead if you kind of know the problems I've come across. Uh, and I'll also describe my solutions. I will be very careful and point out these are my solutions. They're not necessarily great, um, but they do work. Um, so in that sense, they're solutions. So uh, about me, as promised, uh, my name's Neil Stevenson. That's my email address there. Uh, I'm principal architect at Hazelcast. It's not a talk about Hazelcast or about Debezium. It's really just about the change data capture. But because there's a demo in the talk, it's built around Debezium and Hazelcast. So um, it's obviously going to uh, feature, but you know, there's other ways you can achieve the same thing, but the problems are going to be the same. Uh, and obviously this is virtual. If last year or and hopefully next year, I'm going to say stop by the Hazelcast stall and say hello to me in person. Um, but that's not going to happen. So uh, that's just the world we live in right now. So um, it's what time is it? Just gone uh, five past. So I'm going to talk for maybe about 35 minutes and then we'll have about 10 minutes um, of Q&A. And then that gives you kind of 10 minutes to get ready for the next session uh, and so on. Uh, so we're, we're going to start obviously with a bit of an introduction to change data capture. Um, I'm doing it today using Debezium, Hazelcast, Kafka, Mongo, Cassandra, MySQL, a right kind of eclectic mix of technologies because that's what you get in the real world. My uh, five lessons will be kind of uh, spread throughout, uh, and that's a real kind of clickbait kind of thing. The five things you must know uh, about Debezium, you know, they're, they're not going to make you rich or lose weight, but, um, you know, they're just things to, to know about. And uh, a demo, which hopefully will work uh, perfectly because this is being recorded. So let's get uh, into it. Change data capture. Um, I'll, hopefully we're kind of all familiar with this, but I'll kind of go into it because it's kind of important. And I'll, I'll point out some bits that kind of you kind of think you know about it. And then it, when you think a bit more, maybe um, you know about it differently. So. Um, the idea of change data capture is if you've got like an SQL system or some database or whatever, you do uh, an SQL operation and start into table. In this case, I've uh, glorified it with myself. So the primary key is the digit one and then the, another column is new. You do that insert into the database. Um, what it does is it writes a record into a thing I'm calling here redo log. Uh, it might be called an op log or a bin log, but basically it's just a log file uh, and it records that insert statement as happened. So there's an insert comma table one is the table that's been updated and then the columns in table one and new. Um, if I then do um, something like say an update, then I'm now updating the table and I've changed, uh, if you did just go back one, all I'm doing here is just changing my name from uh, camel case to uh, all in uppercase for no particular reason. 
Uh, and what that does is that then creates an update record in the redo log. So the redo log is essentially written sequentially. Um, uh, so it's just a, a series of events that have occurred uh, in the database. And there's a number of kind of reasons for this. The, the idea of the redo log is that you can redo those operations. If somehow your database gets mangled, corrupted, the host it's on breaks or whatever, you use that redo log to rebuild the database to get you back to where you were. Uh, and sometimes it's used if you've got a database system with global replication to replicate that change onto another uh, clone of that database somewhere else in the world. Not really going to talk about global replication, but that's kind of a, a use for it. So this is where we, we kind of need to stop and take a kind of a view from a, a distance of what we're actually seeing. That redo log is an event store. It's recording changes to the database, the inserts and the upset, updates and the deletes. It doesn't record the reads usually um, because the reads aren't changing the database. Uh, so the, the idea of the redo log is it can be used to rebuild the bit database. It's storing all the changes that have occurred. And there's a view of it that you can think the redo log actually is the database. If that's the copy you go to when the database, what you think the database is, is corrupted, then the log is really your system of record. The log is the thing you're relying on. Uh, and what you might think of a table in, in a, a relational database is really just a materialized view of the log file. Um, that's one perspective of it, really that the database is a cache of the log file. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's just a way of kind of thinking of it. Uh, and there's a couple of architectural patterns that kind of exploit this, the, the kind of Lambda pattern and the Kappa pattern in architecture where you're using that log file as uh, an event store that you can drive other things from. Uh, now, kind of where we come to with CDC is that other tools can read that log file. So, you know, it's kind of originally meant just for the database vendor. So if that's, I don't know, MySQL, MySQL writes it, MySQL calls it a bin log, MySQL can read it. Uh, well, other things can read it. So in this diagram, we've got uh, some uh, clients at the top some human beings doing some interactions with a table in the database. Well, they could do that a different way. If there's another tool that can read the redo log, then that can make that same data available to those users in a way that they prefer. Um, now, in this instance, I've gone with Hazelcast for no great surprising reason. Um, my users are now talking to Hazelcast because that's faster, for example. Um, so that's their preference is to take it from this copy. So changes are made to the table, update the redo log, populated in Hazelcast and the users are looking at Hazelcast and that suits them better. So uh, time to kind of come across some problems now. Um, so let's start with uh, one way change data capture. So the idea here is, um, I'm just going to call them system A and system B. Um, system A is some sort of relational database. Uh, there's an update made to that database. It goes into the redo log, it appears in Hazelcast. Um, it's an eventual consistency system. Uh, it's a thing we've kind of all seen in several places, you know, oh, it's updated, give it a few seconds and, and check again online and, and you'll be fine. So that's the idea of one-way CDC something updates in system A and the data passes to system B, but it isn't changed in system B. It's only mutating, only changing in system A. And system B is, is a, essentially a read-only copy of system A that is updated after the fact. So that's problem 1E, this eventual consistency. So uh, what you find is, is typically that redo log is written out after the system A, the database is updated, it's not done at the exact same point in time. Uh, you know, it'd be like a millisecond behind or a hundred seconds behind or whatever, just not a huge amount, uh, but very briefly, the database changes, system A changes, and then system B changes. So there's a very slight latency in getting the change from system A to system B. Um, so system B is telling you the wrong answer. 
uh, very briefly. Well, does that matter? Um, so uh, kind of two things I've been obsessing about is ordering PlayStations and booking hotels. Um, so if you were like a, a doing uh, selling PlayStations and you're doing some sort of reserve and collect, if you are showing the wrong number of PlayStations available uh, on your uh, online web ordering system, then somebody's going to order a PlayStation, turn up to collect it, uh, and there aren't any left. Uh, and that's an absolute disaster that, you know, you obviously lost that customer permanently, but they're then going to start blasting it out on social media and your, your reputation is kind of damaged. If you were a hotel uh, and you've kind of advertised the wrong numbers of ho hotel rooms available, um, is that a problem? Well, I've actually ha had that happen to me. I've turned up a hotel. They'd accidentally overbooked. They just put me into a taxi and put me in a better hotel. Ah, I was like super happy. So, you know, it's not necessarily a problem. It just depends uh, on the application. So that's kind of problem 1A is this kind of eventual kind of consistency, you know, system A updates. And then as a second or so, and system B is now showing the right value. Uh, which brings us on to 1B. I said system A updates, and then a second or so later system B updates. And that's kind of the usual, uh, really. Uh, but it's not always the case. Uh, so what I found out uh, when I was doing this uh, demonstration is that if you use Cassandra 3, it's keeping that redo longer, the memory buffer, and then it flushes it down to the disk when it gets full. Um, and when it gets full, means it gets full. And the smallest size you can set it to on Cassandra 3 is one megabyte. So you have to have one megabyte of changes before the redo log becomes visible, which means you have to have one megabyte of changes to system A before system B updates. And that's just that's totally random. Uh, one megabyte is just the smallest size you can configure for. I think 32 is the default, 32 megabytes. Uh, but crucially, if you're on Cassandra 3, it doesn't do it until um, the, the buffer is full. It doesn't write a half full buffer. So if you've got a one megabyte buffer and you write half a megabyte a day, it's going to take two days for that redo log to appear uh, visible to the change data capture system, and therefore two days for system B to update. Um, you know, I, I really want to strongly stress this is just an example from Cassandra 3. Cassandra 4 does it better which is it can also do it on a time boundary so that if you've, uh, you know, if you haven't written the log out for 10 seconds, just write it anyway, even if it's only half full. So uh, um, nothing negative meant against Cassandra. Just be aware that the, when people talk about things uh, come out, you know, reasonably quickly, it might not. And I wasted days trying to figure this out before, uh, well, maybe not days, but a long time trying to figure this out. And kind of the way I solved it was uh, a bit of a hack, to be honest. So every time I was writing a piece of data to Cassandra, I'd write it several times just to make sure I filled up um, the redo log uh, and cause the redo log to be written out. Um, um, this is a recorded call, but I'll, I'll still say I'm not proud of that answer because it was the wrong thing to do really, just write it 10 times to make sure that the, the buffer fills up, but it worked. It wouldn't have worked well if I was doing something like database triggers. Um, so really that's problem 1A and 1B. 1A is it's not immediate, but 1B is it could be hours before that uh, change appears. Uh, and again, that's the question, does it matter? Uh, PlayStations, yes, hotels, no. Hotels overbook and uh, you know days to sort it out isn't um, a problem. So, Problem two, transactionality. Um, kind of everybody likes transactions because they just push the problem on somebody else. I want to update this, this, and this, and I'll do it in a transaction, uh, and I'll, all my problems go away because it's, you know I commit a rollback. Well, the thing here is that when you write a, a redo log, it's done after the data has changed. So system A has done its commit before the redo log might appear. So if system A has done its commit, then system B can't really reject that, can't trigger a rollback in system A because system A is already committed. So you're kind of stuck. Um, 
you've got two choices. You're getting a, a feed of some data that you cannot um, revert back. You can't do a rollback. You can't make the source system uh, wind it back in and take it. And so you've got the choice. You, you kind of take it, which is means you might get some bad data, you know, violating constraints. So for some reason, you want to reject that data uh, or you don't take it. Uh, that's the choice. And then if you don't take it, your two systems are uh, uh, always deviating because you've dropped one of the changes as opposed to the, the previous thing where they're, they're slow to align. And if you drop a change, well, how do you then get, get it sorted out? You're going to have to figure a way um, to do that. Uh, and I kind of come to looking at that. Uh, if you're looking on transactions with CDC, then you're just trying to solve the wrong problem. It's just not going to work because system A has already updated. You're stuck with it. Um, so does that matter to you? So that was one way change data capture. And this is kind of what we normally kind of think of for change data capture. You're updating a system and then you're reflecting it in another system. Well, kind of in the real world, you might find that you want to make changes in both places. You know, you've got some stuff that's updating system A because it's been in your architecture for years. You've added system B, you like system B more, you're making changes in system B. You've got old stuff updating system A, you've got new stuff updating system B. So you're changing the same data in two places. So you need there two-way change data capture. So every time you change something in system A, as on the previous diagram, you've got to send it to system B, that's fine. Now, when you change it on system B, you have to make system A aware. Um, so that's two-way CDC. And it's not two-way, it's one-way twice. So you've got a one-way CDC feed from system B to system A because you're following this redo log essentially, and you've got a one-way system A to system B, CDC system. So it's two one-way arrows. They don't know about each other. Um, and, and that's the key point. They don't know about each other. Well, what can go wrong with that now? You can probably guess a uh, um, big problem really is looping data feedback. Um, so I can make a change in system A and then it sends it to system B. Well, now the data is changed in system B. System B creates a CDC record to go to system A. System A gets the data change. You can imagine that that data would go round and round in circles if you don't do something about it. And obviously you don't want it going round and round in circles. You know, you want the change here applied there and that's it. Uh, whichever way round you do that change. So ideally, somebody else would solve that problem. Um, you know, the CDC system doesn't do this. Uh, and that's it, problem solved. It's handled for us. Life is easy. Uh, but that doesn't happen in my demo. I had to fix it myself. Um, because it's one-way CDC, the, the idea is that the send, whatever you change in A goes to B, why would you not send a change over? So how I solved this um, was using a, a provenance. Where does this change uh, originate? Uh, the way I went about it, um, there's some standard fields if you're doing kind of JPA style uh, relational database fields. So it's who created this data record and when was it created and who updated this data record and, and when was it updated? Um, so if my data has this, um, uh, these fields, I can use those fields to either filter in or filter out, uh, depending on what they're set to. So basically, if it says it was created in system A and it was modified in system A, then it goes to system B. And if it was modified in system B, it goes to system A and nothing else. Uh, so if you're system A and you get change coming in that originated in system A, well, you can ignore it because you have it already because that's where it began life. And of course, that solution has a problem. So it's a problem with a solution to the problem. Uh, and the problem really is this is coding. You've got to set this correctly. Now, clearly, I've been writing code for years and years and years. I never get it wrong. Yeah, yeah, as if. Certainly, it's a lot easier to assume that other people will get it wrong. So it's a lot nicer to assume that. So that field really needs to be reliable. Ideally, your kind of system A or system B would set that for you. Um, but as 
mentioned, that's not going to happen. So I'm going to have to do it. I need to do it reliably. And it's going to make my data record bigger. Um, now, it's possible in general that you might get help, that the CDC system might give you something like a um, bit of metadata around with the change, you know, like the security principle for the connection or, or the driver name or something that allows you to reliably derive, has this change come in from system, uh, another system or has it originated locally? Problem four, there's only five. Well, five that I've found, there's probably more problems. Double update. So you've got data in system A and system B, you're changing it in both. Well, you could be changing it in both at the same time. So while changes are occurring, they can be passing um, in flight. So you might say, let's say you're doing um, like a stock market order. You're gonna buy shares in company XYZ uh, and you wanna buy say 5,000 shares in company XYZ. Well, you might change it in system A to say, let's make it 6,000 shares. Uh, and on system B, it's not company XYZ, it's company DEF. Uh, well, how do you merge those two changes? So you've changed the same data record in two places. It's not changing separate data that can kind of pass. It's the one data that's going to collide. So maybe you can do can, some sort of merging. You know, and when I said, you know, you're changing the quantity of that stock order and the, the stock code itself, well, that's two separate fields. You could kind of merge them together and say, we'll take, you know, this field from this one and this field from that one. Um, but does that even make any sense? Because if somebody's changed the price and the quantity of an order, uh, or uh, the quantity and, you know, it's not that stock, it's this stock and it's not that amount, it's that amount. It's like, does that even make any sense? Just seems totally wrong to me. And I don't really have an answer for that one other than you kind of detect these collisions and just kind of uh, throw some sort of exception, some sort of dead letter queue or something where somebody, a human being has to go in and figure out how to resolve it because it's too difficult for a machine to do automatically. So time for a demo. CDC system, where are we? So I have, um, this is uh, Hazelcast, but it's not really about Hazelcast, I mentioned. Um, I've got a, a sort of telecoms system. So I have uh, 100,000 call records, 100 customers, uh, and I'm keeping track of various things about the customers, how happy they are, what tariff they're on, and so on. Um, so what I want to do is start pushing some data into this. Uh, I'm going to do this in Kubernetes. Oh, so I'm going to turn on my data feed. Uh, and what that's essentially simulating is data coming in from the outside world uh, for um, call records in a telecom system. So I have called person X and I called them for 10 minutes and the call started at 25 past or, or whatever. Um, now in this system, that's right into a Kafka topic because actually I should have done this first. Let me, uh, one more slide, explain what the demo is about. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, a eclectic mix of technologies. So Hazelcast has got uh, data storage containers that Hazelcast calls the map, the key value stores. So I've got a map A, which is connected to a Mongo database. I've got a map B, which is connected to a Cassandra database and a map C, which is connected to MySQL database. So basically that pulls data out of those systems into separate maps in the Hazelcast system. And my web client can interact with the Hazelcast maps without really caring that the different technologies kind of under the covers. So basically it's a unified uh, front end as far as the client's concerned. I'm retrieving data from this map and it look, uh, you know, don't care what, what's underneath. I have a, a new data feed, which is the thing I just uh, turned on, uh, which flows data into a Kafka topic for call records. Those call records are also fed into map A. So map A is getting populated from the outside world and from the inside world. Um, so it's got two sources for this data change. Every time there's a change to this map data, I write it down. I keep the Kafka copy. Uh, the Kafka data gets reflected down at the Mongo. It's the same for changes that go to the Cassandra system. Um, 
so everything I'm changing in Hazelcast, I'm saving down to the um, Mongo Cassandra MySQL. In fact, I don't change MySQL here to kind of enough examples. And everything that changes in Cassandra or Mongo gets fed into Kafka topic and back into Hazelcast, and that's our loop. So we have jobs, which will start in a second, which also change data in Mongo or Cassandra simulating you know other parts of your application architecture so internal changes so you might have say um updates you know somebody writes in a change to the name and address well that's like an update to the customer record and that's maybe just applied directly into the customer storage system because that piece of the, the application tech stack's been around for years and the call data records are coming in live because that's where they're coming in from so we've got things that are happening in live and things that are happening in batch So I'm using here a tool called um, CAFDROP, nothing to do with Hazelcast. Um, it just browses Kafka topics. So if I'm looking at my calls topic, Kafka topics, just like a queue, I can look at the messages on my calls topic. And basically they're just a piece of JSON, um, you know, that have some sort of primary key, telephone number you call from, telephone number you're calling to, uh, because these are cell phones, it's like, which cell you're connected to which masked how long did the call last 12 seconds was it a successful call as in did the call get accidentally disconnected uh, and the provenance part where is this data come from it was created by the data feed system so i know on my um cdc jobs where that data has originated from this has come from the outside world uh, and if I was to look in my Hazelcast maps, we'll see, oh, the number of call data records is going up. It was on 99,500, uh, and gradually it's creeping up because people are making telephone calls. But now what I need to do is start um, feeding in some local changes. Uh, so now I'm going to update my uh, legacy systems, my Cassandra and my um, Mongo. Uh, I just picked those just as a, a collection of ones we use. There's no particular reason it's Cassandra or Mongo, uh, other than just to make things fun. So what we'll now find is that we're now changing data in Cassandra and Mongo, uh, which is picked up by CDC and fed to Hazelcast. Um, and I'll show you how my uh, CDC works. We've got about seven minutes left on, on the, the slides before we go to Q&A. So, Really just as two parts to it. When I change data in Hazelcast, it calls a store function that sends it directly into, uh, this one is call data records, which are going to Cassandra. Um, basically it's setting, um, where was this data modified? Um, when was it modified? Well, modified by now, now is just a timestamp. Uh, and then it just saves it. And this is my, filtering logic. So if it's come from the legacy update, then I just log it out and don't save it. And if it's come from somewhere else, I do save it. So that's my uh, CDC filter, essentially. Data has changed in Hazelcast. If it's got this particular originating location, uh, then I don't save it. I don't keep that loop going. I just dig discard that data from the CDC side. So that's Hazelcast saving to Cassandra. Uh, the reverse on the other panel is Cassandra writing to Hazelcast. Uh, so Cassandra writes to Kafka and Hazelcast reads from Kafka. There's an extra little loop there. And I'm looking for um, who, where was this data modified? Does the modified string have a particular value? If it does, uh, then I just null out the record and that causes it not to go anywhere. Otherwise, I just let the record through uh, and set various other fields on it and blah, 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 and then I return a, a key value here. So really, it all boils down to this. You've got this log, uh, this test on the input feed and this test, same test on the output feed, only you're testing for different values. Are you excluding it because it's come from the outside world or excluding it? because it's come from the inside world. And if we look on our, um, let me just refresh my call records, what we should find, uh, if we were to look opposite 130, yeah, 
let's do something else. So let's look at our customer updates in Mongo on the Kafka topic. So these first customer updates this is what you get actually at CDC. You've got a big piece of uh, structured data. So you have a field and it's called version and it's a string and it's not optional. You've got a field and it's called connector and so on. Um, and you scroll all the way down and you find your actual uh, data payload, um, which tells me that I have come from this version of this connector. So that might be a piece of metadata I could use to filter my data out. Um, but basically I'm getting a CDC record and this is the after record and the ID is this. Uh, and you know it's created by this and it's got these attributes created date and what matters is how did that data get created so that first data record was created by my legacy update job uh, and if I can scroll back up so the CDC record is really large you know there's a lot of stuff in it that you don't necessarily need and if I look at offset 144 uh, there we go Look at the records towards the end offset is just the uh, sequence counter. So the 143 is the last one before offset 144. And I scroll down. Somewhere in here is my data payload. Here we go. And what I can see is it was created by the preload legacy, but it was updated by the update legacy. So it's been updated by a batch job in my system essentially so because that's been updated by a batch job i want that data to be filtered in or filtered out um, that's it so uh, last four minutes onto my back to the slide deck so just kind of um quick look at the data so this is here's an example of cassandra data you're getting these fields these are the fields i'm using for my derivation of what i get filtered in or filtered out so you get a field like last modified date, it's a timestamp. Uh, has that field been deleted from the record? No, it hasn't. Uh, has it been set? Yes, it has. And I might get uh, last modified by. So what, how did that data get changed? Who changed it? Um, we're not so interested in how it was created, it's when it was changed. Uh, and you get a similar, but not identical thing from uh, Mongo. So each of the CDC flavors gives you something slightly different. Um, which makes life uh, fun. But fundamentally here, because it's an update, you get an after record. If it was a delete, the after record would be null. So uh, summary, then we'll do uh, take questions. Uh, so the big thing that, that tripped me uh, was eventual consistency. You kind of need to know what you're, you typically expect, but really how bad it can be. Um, so you need to know, uh, really, the one that matters is how bad it can be. And, and what I was doing on my code to force data to come out was I rewriting it repeatedly to kind of ensure that the redo log filled up. Uh, and that's not a great answer, um, but it works. Um, it's a bad answer for things like audit and for things like database triggers, but it works. Um, so it works, it's a good answer. Um, but yeah, I'm not proud of that one. Um, so typically, you know, what you'll see is a system updates and the other one refreshes fairly soon. You know, you've all heard these things, you know, give it a few seconds, but you need to know, is it three seconds, 10 seconds, 6,000 seconds? How long is it going to be? Um, transactionality, eh, just forget that. It's just not going to work. Uh, feedback loops. They're bad because your data will go round and round and round it, and it will, again, it's causing more updates, more stress on your system. And you saw the size of those change records so that, you know, if you change them more times than necessary, then you're just using up disk space storing stupid information. You're causing lots of uh, processing that you don't need to do. So filter things out, um, which comes on to the, the kind of provenance, which is how you do that filtering. That was just my best way to do it. I say, well, where did this change originate? Ideally, the change data record would tell you something in the metadata that you could rely on because if the, the, the source system, if the database sets it, then it's pretty likely to set it correctly in all occasions. 
if your code sets it, then uh, it might be fine for a while and then somebody new joins the team and adds some extra lines of code and, and uh, didn't know about this feature and suddenly, you know, you're filtering out based on, you know, is it X, Y, or Z, and suddenly there's a, a W comes in and, and your code breaks. Um, so that provenance thing is really kind of a, a very brittle solution in, in my mind. Um, but it was the best I could come up with. Um, you know, you're changing data, you need to filter it out. Um, filter it out based on fields that the application code sets is like, well, let's hope it sets correctly now and in the future. Um, and then that last one is double updates. It's very easily possible that there'll be, you know, like users are updating the, the kind of uh, the, the fast system. And then there's the batch that's updating the, the slow system. And inevitably, we'll be updating the same data records now and again. How do you detect that the same record is updated in two places? Well, that's not really too difficult, but how do you kind of resolve it? You know, so if it's two different fields, perhaps you could combine them if they both change the field. So, you know, it's that um, back to the stock market. Somebody's saying, I want to buy a thousand and uh, units or something. And so one system changes it to 1200, another system changes it to 1100. You know, they've updated the same field. What do you do? You just got to kind of um, throw some sort of exception into some manual resolution queue because I just don't think there's a, a general purpose solution. So that's me. Um, we've got 10 minutes for questions. Perfect, thank you. Then I will uh, stop the recording.